All right, so let's just quickly look at serve. Okay, um, I'm going to show you a serve model that I think is, let me explain it this way. This is the brick house in the three little pigs. You know the story of the three little pigs? There are easier ways to make a serve, but they're not as robust and they might fall down later on. What I'm going to show you is something that is more like the brick house. It takes slightly longer to build, but when you build it, you get a better serve. So years and years ago, I used to teach serve like, like this, right? Um, then I watched something, I'll tell you what I watched, and I, I, something twigged off in my head. Now I teach a serve like this. What we do is we start the ball in the racket here like this, and we make a little split like that, right? So we just go like that, and then my impact point's there above my head. All right, who's ever said that the impact point is out to the right and in front? Put your hand up right now, honestly. You lied. It's not, right? Okay, we all used to say it was over there. It's not, it's there. Because if it's there, who's ever said your highest possible point? Right, it's not. If you're at your highest possible point, you can't internally rotate your shoulder. You have to have some bend in your elbow, right? If you have bend in your elbow, look, if I put my hand, look, if, if that's my impact point, right, there, look what happens when I take my hand away. See how my hand's in a completely neutral and natural position, right? If I, you tell me my impact point's over there, look what happens when I take my hand away. It's gone around the corner. That's tough. So you actually, if you said that, I'm sorry you made it harder. But I stand here making that confession to everybody as well. I've said it thousands and thousands and thousands of times, right? Okay, so look, the impact point should be there. If I do this, just watch. I'm going to do this as my first little serve. That's going to be my first little serve. In fact, I've got a serve before that, which is this one. Yeah, see, like this. Right. Then I'm going to take it up here. Hand open, hand closed. That's all we're doing. Right, hand open, hand closed. What grip have I got? I've got a continental grip because if, you, if I, you allow me to hit the ball above my head, it's not difficult. If you make me hit the ball over there, it is. Okay? We only know this from slow-mo, so don't feel guilty because before slow-mo came in, we were all getting it wrong. All right? So watch. So I just start these kids with serving like this. That's your serve. Okay? Then, when they get good at that, I make them do this. That's your serve. Then when they get even better at it, we do this. That's your serve. And then when they get better at it, we do this. That's your serve. And then we get better at it, we do this, that's your serve. You're right, good duck. All right, okay, we'll get him in a minute. All right, you see, so what we did was we grew the serve. But the most interesting thing is where it came from. Do you recognize it? Huh? Yeah, it's a, uh, it takes longer to do this than it does to just do this, right? I'll tell you why you should recognize it. Have you ever done this? Okay, what I want you to do is just return this ball here. There we go, there's one there. Do that there. Yeah, okay, do that one there. Okay, do that one there. It's a coach serve. <laughs> it's your feeding serve. If you've ever stood here and, fit and hit balls into the service box, you don't do this. You stand there like this, you put your racket up here like this. Right, just return that one. All right, because it's simple, it's efficient, it's effective, it's just a smaller version of the bigger action with the same rhythm. And I was watching, I was literally on the balcony at my club. That's a really good serve to teach kids. And guess, they, and I haven't had, in all the time I've been doing it, there are kids that are special kids, of course, right? But very few problems with ball toss. Because the other thing is, you start like this, by the time the kids, the, the ball's all over the place, by the time the kids got to here, he's lost control of the racket. Unfortunately, so many of our problems 
we caused ourselves. Because we didn't think, of it. so for example, if you, if you, you wouldn't tell a six year old, right, I want to see your racket coming out this side of your body. You'd be very happy if he could do this. A smaller version of the big action. This is a nice little forehand. Look, it's just a smaller version of the big action. It fits the strength and coordination level of the player. That's what we get, go back to right we said at the beginning. Right? So we don't have to spend time on this because you already do it. You do it from there. All you have to just say for five years is this. Uh, yeah. Just make it a little bit bigger. 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 Make it a little bit bigger. Easy instruction. You started with the right grip. Right? You start with a rhythm. If you listen to any of the biomechanists, if you've, if you've ever been around Jack Groppo or Bruce Elliott or any of those you to do on serve for everyone is rhythm. Mike, do Don't want, break do the rhythm. Yeah? No, I'm, I'm pushing the ball now because, no look, hold it, look, think of it looking at this, right? That's where it's going on now. Yeah? Okay. Then it goes on there. 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 I've seen so many kids who do this, like. We've seen all those kind of things because somebody's talked to them about loading legs and driving and, and the worst one is jumping when they go, oh bloody hell, jumping. No body jumps. What you do is you stretch the body so much, you load so much that when you explode, you come off the ground. No body jumps, right? When they jump, they go, and do this. So yeah, of course we're going to get to loading with the legs when they're in green or a latter part of orange. But to start with, adding more bits, adding more bits, adding more bits, adding more bits. So it's literally boom, boom, boom. Look, my legs have already started now. Look, as I start to go wider, my legs are starting. Yeah, they're starting. <laughs> yeah? But don't start down there, because I'll end up, you'll end up with some real wacky, wonderful serves. All right? Okay, that's all we're going to touch on the serve, because uh, that's actually the whole path of the whole serve in terms of it technically. We're going to talk about it tactically a little bit though, as we move into orange and green. Right, well, as we go to leave red, does anyone have any questions on red? When do you take them from red to green? <laughs> what about orange in the middle? Okay, well, the, the question's very simple, right? What are you trying to build, right? And like, you'll get, you'll get parents say, my kid can hit from the baseline. So have you seen those, have you seen those two eight, um, seven-year-old boys that are on the, the best mini tennis point ever, da, 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 on YouTube? Yeah, they're from the club that I'm at. Or they're at, sorry, that was filmed at the club I'm at. They're neither of those boys actually are from that club, but that was the, right. Do you think those boys could hit from the baseline with a yellow ball? Yes, they could. They could, hang on, you've got to listen to the question again. Do you think they could hit from the baseline with the yellow ball? Yes. Okay, now let's, now let's go. Do you think they could construct points accurately? No, okay. Do you think they could work out patterns of play? Do you think that they could do the, do you think they could use the same technical skills they were using that's where we start going. So it sort of depends on what your map is, right? You can decide, and it's not for me to really say, but my advice is they must be able to control the ball in a short space. They must be able to control the ball uh, down the line. They must be able to control the ball cross court. They must be able to change direction. They must on the serve be able to direct the ball to the forehand or the backhand side of the player. They must be able to volley away from their opponent. If they can't do those things, I want them to do those things before they go to orange. Because if I now move them to orange, I've got an upside down pyramid. Now, you might say, well, my kids can't all do that. Well, okay, you've got to make a, you'll have to make a judgment call somewhere along the line. If your kid's as big as Isu, you're probably gonna go, well, you know what? I probably need to at least put them on an orange court. But your set of competencies is your map. And you have to build those based on what we're talking about today and make decisions. And look, I'm going to be really honest with you. There is no perfect set of competences, right? 
There is no perfect map that somebody's written for this right now. It's too new. We are all explorers and adventurers on a voyage of discovery with these balls. What we do know is 10 year olds and 11 year olds around the world right now look better than Rafa did and Roger did when they were 10 and 11. Now, whether that means at 14, they completely freak out and end up being lunatics, I had no idea, right? I don't know, no one knows. But what you are starting to see with things like um, orange bowl and things like um, uh, tarbs, which is kind of like an orange bowl in Europe, and the, the, the Smyrnik Bowl in Croatia is a lot more variety, a much higher level of ta tactical development than we were seeing before. So we are seeing players better than they were before. You see? So that's all we can say. You cannot say, this is going to produce, this is the saviour, this is the magic Harry Potter wand. Right now, it's based on everything we've seen, it's better. But you know what? There's no proof to say it's going to work, and there's no proof, but there's also no proof to say that the yellow ball really works. Because people say, oh yeah, but these players that are in the top 100 played with the yellow ball. Yeah, but what if they had played with the red, orange and green ball? You don't know how good they would be. It's challenging to think that Djokovic could be any better than he is already, but who knows? There's no proof either way. You can never have proof on any of this stuff. Even the Jimmy and Johnny studies from the 1930s, where they took twins and they got one to do one and one to do another, they still couldn't prove conclusively. It's like everything, you know? It's a bit of faith. It's a bit of faith. It's about trying to do the job better. It's about trying to move with the times. But I can't write your map for you. You're going to have to kind of make a decision. Yeah? And then the first thing you're going to do, once you've got all those competencies, when you move to the next court is, you've got to re-establish all those competencies. So your red two competencies, end of red, and your orange one competencies, beginning of orange, are the same. They're just on the bigger court. Yeah? So you go, right, I could go down the line, I can go cross court off the forehand and the backhand, I can change the length of the swing, I can change the direction of the ball, I can serve to the forehand, I can serve to the backhand, I can come to the net and volley away from my opponent. On the red court, tick. I'll transition to the orange court. So I'll do some red ball, some orange ball, but now I've got to do all that on orange court before I even try and add any more things. Yeah? All right. Elliot, you put your hand up. Okay. Are you saying that to move from red to orange, you have to be able to check? The red ball has to be in a controlled direction from either side. Yeah. God, yeah. They have to be able to do that. I haven't seen that yet with any of our red kids. Okay, Houston, we have a problem because you're the National Tennis Centre. Okay, all right, I'll, I'll ask you this question, coach. Tony, I'll ask you this question, right? What is the real skill that you need to be able to do that, right? So let's just look at this real skill. Someone jump up and play. Oh, you're back again, all right? Okay, think about this. My suggestion would be you're looking too much at a technical conformity issue because actually, look, if I'm Mrs. Brown, right? I can hit the ball over there. I can hit the ball over there. Hit the ball over there. All right. So if you are, if you're saying every forehand has to look like this, you will probably not get to that point with every kid you're going with. Not even with the technical. They absolutely do, Tony, unfortunately. They do? All around the world. <laughs> All around the world. And it's a big problem that we have because people are assuming he can get the ball over the net five times, he moves on to the next colour. Remember, this is about player development as well, right? But this is about making good players, right? So I'm not saying every kid who comes once a week should be able to do that. But I would, none of the kids, none of my kids, no, but even my once a week, none of my kids in the programme I work in, none of them will move to orange unless they can do that. And we have 250 red kids. So that's 250 London kids. They're not the brightest kids in the world, right? 250 kids in London can all do it before they move. It's, I think you have to start reflecting on what you're teaching, how you're teaching, what it's about. And it goes back to the first thing we all wanted to do. The first thing we all wanted to do was look at the stick at that end, rather than look what's happened with the ball. Yeah, and teach the game. Okay, anything else? 
All right, okay. Explain to the person next to you what's red about. All right. What's red about? Quickly. Got 30 seconds, go. What's red about? Tony, what? This is this is my suggestion, right? So, this is what I would do if I was in your position. I would go to the. I would. I, if I was if I was the boss over there, right? What I would say is, I would sit you all down and I would say, right, I want you to write a list of all the kids you would like to work with twice a week instead of once a week. No, that's the problem. Your choice. No, hold on. No, write a list. Right? You write a list. You write a list. You write a list. Everyone writes a list, and then you just phone them up, and then you say this. Elliot asked us to write a list who we wanted to work with twice a week, and I put your kid's name on the list any chance they could come twice a week instead of once a week. We're doing a special group, yeah. all right? That's all you have to do, because it doesn't matter whether you're doing music, art, language, sport, or anything, once a week, unfortunately, will never make a yeah. good tennis player. That's the thing, player. most of us see these kids once a week. Yeah, but you have to ask, because a parent has to know that they, you're genuinely interested in their kid coming more often. Right. We did that, we got 90 kids, right? 90 kids. Who said they'd come more often? We did a discount of like 25% on your second right. lesson and whatever, and, and we made some special groups. But you have to start managing them and getting them to come more often. Because okay. if they're only coming once a week, you're yeah. always, you, I mean, you can't learn the language. What did, what they did yeah, the you can't week. learn, you know. And the other thing you might do is say, okay, if they can't afford to come twice a week, let's have Sunday at four o'clock, this court, all red courts, open, practice. Yeah, parents can come with their kids. It'll be free. free. We play for a, we pay for a pro. Yeah. There's lots of different ways to do this. Lots and lots of different ways. But you've got to do it. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Before we move on, then, real quick. So, quick. Hold on. Just a quick. So, this is. I don't know if everyone knows um, Simon Gale up in Yonkers, right? Yeah. Strange name for a place, Yonkers, right? <laughs> right. Anyway. Um, we had this discussion a couple of years ago when I went in for a day's consulting with Simon and he got all his pros to wear a badge that said X2, right, for two months. It just said X2, these weird badges. And all the parents started going, what's this X2 thing you're wearing? And that was enough to start the discussion of we're trying to get as many kids as possible to get on a tennis court twice a week. It doesn't mean take lessons twice a week. Right? It doesn't mean that. You could say, this court is free on a Saturday at 5. We're going to free up a pro Saturday at 5. I know it's not a great time for pros to be working Saturday at 5. But here's a, all right, bring your kid. Court's free. We'll teach you to play with your kid. You could say, we have lessons, but then we have a practice once a week. Friday night, 5 o'clock, everyone can come for free. Right? The lessons are 1 to 6 ratio. Practice is 1 to 36. Right? You have to get the kid to step on the court twice a week. If they don't step on the court twice a week, it's the same as everything else. It doesn't matter if it's music, art, language, sport, or anything. If you're just coming once a week, you are never going to be good. Who's ever tried to learn a language in the car? <laughs> yeah, you know, like, you put the CD on, you get really into it, and then you forget next time, you forget next time. Ten days go by, you don't put the CDs on, right? You, you, don't, you can't learn, it's not possible to actually learn that much in that time and be good. And remember, being competent is what sets the spark. I've never met a kid who said, when I grow up, I want to be a really crap tennis player. <laughs> they're all dreaming. They'd all like to be good. They're, you know, if they're here, they're for goodness sake, they're in the home of the US Open. So you need to just sort of say, well, look, I'm not asking you to give up everything you do in your life. But every other sport, remember, demands twice a week. All the team sports demand twice a week. Somewhere along the line, it doesn't, I'm not talking about charging the parents. Find a way to get the kids on the court twice a week. Make a program instead of selling lessons. You have to sell a program, not lessons. Right, like the one we just did at Sport Time, they have a lesson every week now, they've got tournaments, they've got social things, they've got a reward system, <laughs> you know, sort of junior team tennis, yeah. They've got all these different things. You have to build a program and you have to get the kids on twice a week. Otherwise, it's not you're wasting your time, but you're always paddling upstream, big time. No, 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 but don't do that, right? Let's stop. Yeah, but so, so, no, it's not. No, it's not, okay, hold on. All right, I'm gonna get you with this one, because you picked me one of my right? What's the number one form of tennis played in the world? High school tennis. Doubles. 
Doubles is the number one form of tennis. More people are doing that every week, right, than playing singles around the world, right? Most people compete in a team already. They play for their club, they play team tennis, they play for their college. I asked 100 US pros in 2012 what was the number one competitive experience they'd had. 87 of them said playing college tennis. So just copy college tennis. You are the greatest, I'm gonna be good for America now, right? <laughs> you are the greatest sporting nation in the world in terms of teams, right? Look at college football, look at everything that goes on in teams. Get on the bandwagon of making teams. Don't sell a lesson, sell a team. When you join, you're six kids, here's your t-shirt. Here's, we went and bought a heat press for 150 bucks from the shop down there, from the place down the road. What name do you want on the back? Yeah? <laughs> Done, right, you're on this team. We're gonna get ready for this event. You know, six times a year we're gonna go here. We're gonna take all the kids to US Open. Make a team culture within your club, right? What team sports don't have at a young age is professional coaches. It's people that are paid to do this. So we do have an advantage in some ways. You can, or there are also some kids that leave team sports because they don't like the performance of their team and they want to be an individual. We have the best of both worlds, but you have to stop thinking about selling lessons and stop thinking about it being an individual sport and understand it can be both, right? And tennis can be really cool, it can be the best thing. And that, if you start doing that, we can always blame something else, right? We can always say soccer's so big, yeah? Baseball's on the TV. We could always blame something else. There are enough kids out there for us all to have programs that are overflowing if we just think about this in the right way, right? And every single program, I mean, like my club, we used to have, we did the Harry Potter thing. We had two teams, like two houses in school, you know? And you got points. And we had the Chubba Chub Cup which is like the Stanley Cup. It was that big, it's a huge thing, full up with chubba chub lollipops. And when the ribbons went on the thing every 10 weeks, you know, whoever won it. And the kids would do anything. They would go up and go, I'll play you for 10 tickets. Come on, you're on the other team, right? They would do anything, they were battling, and it was like, the, it was like two houses. There's so many examples out there. We just have to look outside of tennis a bit more and go explore these things a bit more, right? We're just very guilty of selling tennis lessons because that's what we've always done and that used to work doesn't work anymore. There's too many other distractions, there's too many other things. We have to think past that. All right, okay. <coughs> so, so, but then stop selling just tennis lessons. Because if, you if, if you've got a kid and you work on serve, rally and score, you can have 24 kids across these two courts right, for their second session. One to six in their lesson and then a practice. Kids need to practice. Pros practice all the time. They don't have lessons. They practice, they hit balls, organize a practice, have a lesson and a practice. They're two different things. We have to start thinking a bit differently, right? It doesn't have to be expensive. And I tell you what, a baseball bat's more expensive than a tennis racket. And you have to buy those silly trousers that are all gray and whatever. And you know, I don't why do I wear gray all the time. What's that about, right? There's so, all the other sports are expensive too, honestly, apart from soccer. Right, all the other sports. God, um, American football, for goodness sake. You've got these nine-year-olds with helmets and pads and how much does that lot cost? Yeah, exactly. So we've got to get past all that. All right, we can get past that. Right, we need to move on.